Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Ronald Coleman in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you the story of a mind reader who discovers his nightclub act is not a fake, a vision of death. Our star, Mr. Ronald Coleman. Help! Help! What's the trouble, Oscar Otto? It's my battery, Harlow. Water, please! Why, sure! But why not avoid that battery distress, Oscar? Get an Autolite Stayful, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Is that a fact, Harlow? A fact that millions of cars and owners have proved for themselves, Oscar. And the Autolite Stay Full gives longer life, too. Fiberglass retaining mats protect every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and give the Autolite Stay Full longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. Where do I get this no-worry battery, Harlow? From your nearest Autolite battery dealer. To quickly locate him, phone Western Union by number and ask for operator 25. I'll tell you the name of your nearest Autolite battery dealer, where you can get an Autolite Stay Full, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents A Vision of Death, starring Mr. Ronald Coleman, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. If I speak too rapidly for your stenographer, you'll tell me, won't you, Lieutenant? No offense, but um, he impresses me as someone who has to sit on the floor to put on his shoes. And stop me if I seem to wander away from the point, won't you? I mean to say, this is my first and, I hope, final appearance in a police precinct, and I should hate to give a sloppy performance. We were always known, Aurora and I, for the smoothness and gem-like precision of our act. As far as this murder... Uh, rap, I suppose it's called, is concerned. An acquaintance with our act is the essential rabbit. Awfully good act. Smart, informal, occasionally humorous, and always mystifying. Well, the act always began with music, never with the cliché fanfare of trumpets or roll of drums. I would saunter out to the center of the floor and say something like, uh, Good evening. You are about to witness an exhibition of mental telepathy. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce Aurora, my wife? Ah, they never fail to give her a hand. What would they applaud? Why, the vision she presented as she came toward me. There has never been anyone as lovely as Aurora, the most beautiful flesh in the profession. Now, Aurora, would you care to tell the audience or shall I? You tell them, Judd, while I tie the blindfold across my eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, all mind readers employ a gimmick. A gimmick is a trick, a device. For example, when the mind reader threading his way through the audience says to the mind reader sitting blindfolded on the stage, a lady has given me a small object which I now hold in my hand, what is it? And the mind reader sitting blindfolded replies, a silver coin. The answer has not come through mind reading, no. It has come through the gimmick, a cue or signal communicated through the very question itself. But we don't do that. We do not. You will notice, ladies and gentlemen, that I never speak to Aurora at all. Now, are you ready, Rory? Ready, Jeff. Here we go, then. Now, uh, you, sir, you have something? Good. Concentrate upon it like a good chap. And the you, madam... The gentleman ma holds a coin in his hand. It's a Mexican peso bearing the date 1892. <laughs> Oh, oh, that's very clever of you, madam. I'll be surprised if she gets this one. <laughs> the now, lady holds in her hand her other hand. <laughs> yep, a sucker once born remains a sucker till death. The audience never realized, never in all the years we worked, that although I was not speaking to Aurora directly... My chatter, nevertheless, was loaded with signals and cues for her guidance. By revealing the gimmick, we concealed the gimmick, and that, Lieutenant, is the knee plus ultra of gimmicks. <laughs> yes, it was as crude as that. 
but it enabled us to work 50 weeks a year here and abroad at an average of over a thousand a week. Of course, I always gave some credit for our success to, to our agent, Harry Arnold, although Rory was inclined to give him no credit at all. Good news, Judd. I've managed to book the act into the college inn in Chicago with a four-week guarantee. That's not bad, huh? Get him. He managed to book the act. I suppose they never heard of us in Chicago. I suppose we weren't held over there six weeks when we played the Saint Souci in 1948. Well, you think it's easy to get a four-week guarantee these days? Money is short, money is tight. I have never yet heard you say money is long, money is loose. You have to sweat for your 10%, don't you? Yes, you do. In a pig's ear, you do. Agents, they're all alike. There's gratitude for you. There's the milk of human memory. <laughs> what were you when I first saw you? Nothing, not this much. Playing ten a day on a canvas in Menashe, Wisconsin, and paid off in bottle tops. I worked, I schemed, I sweated. Agents, all of them. All they know is how to live off a dead whale. Scum of the earth. I'm not going to take that from you, you hear me? You'll take it, baby, along with the 10%. You'll take it, you'll chew it, you'll swallow it, and you'll keep it down. How do you like that? I'm warning you, kid, don't push me too far. Don't uh, push uh, me too... Children, children, now on your way, Harry, and don't let it get you down. I think a four-week guarantee is pretty good. Thanks, Judd. If it wasn't for you, I'd... No, oh, why go into it? I'm going for a walk. But aside from these altercations between Rory and Harry, it was smooth sailing. We wore the best, ate the best, drank the best, stayed at the finest hotels. And every Saturday night after the performance, Harry would bring us our salary. He'd bring it in cash. A thousand, twelve fifty, fifteen hundred. <laughs> I've the old performer's distrust of checks. Been given too many with a high latex content. Anyway, life couldn't have been more placid. And then, one evening... About five weeks ago, soon after we opened the Grove here in town, a frightening thing occurred. We'd just begun the act, and I was out in the audience. You will notice, ladies and gentlemen, that I never speak to Aurora at all. Now, are you ready, Rory? Ready, Judge. Here we go, then. Now, uh, you, madam, The lady you have holds in her hand a compact. It is platinum. It bears her initials R.C. Uh, 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 you, sir. The gentleman have you... is holding an engagement ring. In it are three small diamonds. I, I, uh, uh, miss, well, what would you... Lady, the young lady is holding... It's a small cameo brooch. Rory! Rory! Uh, Maurice! Music! I, I picked Rory up from the floor and hurried with her to our dressing room, almost beside myself with anxiety. I placed her on the couch, dampened a towel and put it on her forehead and began to chafe her wrists. Rory. Rory, honey, Rory. Judd, Judd. I'm here, Rory. Are you all right? I, I guess so. I don't know what happened. Well, you fainted away. Try to remember what happened. I, I felt funny. I don't remember. No, no, try, Rory. Try. Try to remember. It's important. I, I can't. Why is it important? You don't know? Rory, you don't know? You were calling out the answers before I even had a chance to give you the cues. <laughs> Do you believe in telepathy, Lieutenant? I don't mean the sort of thing Rory and I usually did. I mean real telepathy. Uh, I never did either until that night. I don't mind telling you I was badly shaken. I mean, after all, I, I knew we'd been using a gimmick, and suddenly it began to happen without the gimmick. Scared us to death. We didn't know what we were getting into, but we went on with the act. And in my mind, I began to search about for the answer. I found it, of course. You'll find a gimmick in almost everything, if you look hard enough. I've got it, Rory. We work together so long that you know what I'm about to say before I say it. From my inflection, my pauses, even my movements. You see? Oh, Judd, that has to be it. Oh, this is marvelous. When Harry gets back, I'll tell him about it. And if I last till tomorrow, he can ask the management for more dough. As soon as he gets back. Next Thursday. Tonight. 
How much more should we ask for? Tonight? What made you say tonight? Well, I don't know. Well, you were there when he told me he'd be in Palm Springs till Thursday. What made you say tonight? I don't know. What difference does it make? Stop picking on me. So I made a mistake, so what? <laughs> I don't see how you can make such a mistake, that's oh, all. Oh, Judd, leave me alone. I've been worried half crazy about really being able to read your mind. I've been under a strain. So Harry's coming back Thursday and not tonight. All right, are you satisfied? He'll be here Thursday, not tonight. You just in stone, mister? This dressing room, eh? Yeah, what is it? Telegram, sign here. Uh, sign for it, will you, Rory? There you are, kid. Judd, I... I'm sorry I blew up in your face. Judd, what's the matter? It's... it's from Harry. He's coming in tonight. And he did, too, Lieutenant. Rory was so upset by it, she couldn't go on at all that evening. She had no explanation for how she knew, none whatsoever. I don't know, Judd. I, I just don't know. My mind seemed to go blank. I seemed to hear a voice whisper in my ear. Harry Arnold will be with you tonight. That's all. When we got back to our suite at the hotel, Harry was there, waiting for us. Well, what happened? Well, what happened? You both look like ghosts. Look, Harry, I'll tell you some other time. Leave us alone, will you? All right, I'm going. I just came to wish you a happy birthday and to give you this. Birthday? Oh, oh, oh thanks, Harry. Yeah, thanks. What is it? Well, open it, why don't you? It's a bathrobe. A red silk bathrobe. With your initials. That's right, it's a red... How does she know? How do you know? Get out of here! Get out of here! Judd, make him get out of here! I won't be talked to like that! I don't care who she is, I won't be talked now, to Harry, like that! Harry, shut up! For heaven's sake, shut up and go away. Leave us alone. Go, get out! Get out! You too, Judd? She's got you talking against me too? All right, I'm going! I'm going, but from here on in, it's strictly business between us. I wash my hands! Kept his word, Lieutenant. From that time on, he kept himself to himself. And I was prepared to let it go at that, much as I liked Harry. Until the night I was awakened by Rory, moaning in her sleep. No. No, please, no. No. Rory. Rory, no. wake up. You're having a bad dream, no. Rory. No. Uh. Uh. Judd. Judd. Shh, shh. It's all right. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, Judd. What, what, Rory? The voice. Whispering again? Yes. Oh, Judd. What? He's going to kill me. Harry Arnold is going to kill me. And that, Lieutenant, was the beginning of the end of that. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ronald Coleman in A Vision of Death. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey, hello. Here's a riddle. Shoot, Oscar Otto. I got it. And I have it. You've got an Autolite Stay Full battery, and now you have a power-packed Paragon that gives quick, dependable starts and needs water only three times a year in normal car use. You said a Stay Full, Harlow. Just what every driver should say when he needs a battery, Oscar. An Autolite Stay Full with the fiberglass retaining mats protecting every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and give that brawny battery longer life as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. So, friends, choose the battery that states right on the case needs water only three times a year in normal car use. To learn quickly where to get an Autolite Stay Full battery, just phone Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. I'll tell you the location of your nearest Autolite battery dealer, the expert on all makes of batteries. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, 
Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Ronald Coleman in Elliot Lewis's production of A Vision of Death, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> Rory, get a grip on yourself. He's going to kill me. Harry's going to kill Harry, me. Don't be ridiculous. Stop it now. It was just a bad dream. He's going to kill me. Now, will you stop that? Will you stop saying oh, that? Judd, hold me. I'm frightened. Harry's going to kill me. You've had a bad dream, I tell he you. He hates me. He hates me. Oh, Judd, he's going to kill me. <laughs> I'm a rational man, Lieutenant. I've always felt, for example, that when Hamlet says there are stranger things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio, Horatio ought to reply, tell that to Sweeney. I knew there was no such thing as mental telepathy. I knew it as well as I know I'm sitting here talking to you. Up here in my head, I knew it. And yet, the next afternoon, I found myself entering a gun shop and purchasing a revolver and a box of bullets. Determined that before Harry Arnold could so much as injure one hair of Rory's head, I would kill him. I should have gone directly to the police first. (laughs) You're using hindsight, Lieutenant. I had all that out with Rory. Please, Judd, please, go to the police. Tell them about this. Let them handle it. Tell them what? That by reading his mind, we've learned Harry intends to murder you? They'll believe us. They've got to believe us. You're reasoning like a child. They'll decide that it's either a publicity stunt or else that we're both lunatics. But if I tell them about the telegram and the birthday present... Rory, we have no proof. We have to do something. What? Tell me what. You know he intends to kill you. I know he intends to kill you. But what can we do? Do you know when he's going to do it or how he's going to do it? No. He hasn't decided yet. Oh, Judd, isn't there anything we can do? Nothing. Except wait... I reacted to the waiting as you might expect, Lieutenant. Sleeplessness, loss of appetite, growing irritability. I flared up at everyone. Waiters, chambermaids, elevator boys, the manager of the club. The manager of the club? He finally said to me... Stone, what the devil's gotten into you? I'd really like to know. None of your business. Well, look, I'm only trying to be nice. Oh, shut up and leave me alone. Sure, I'll let you alone. I'd let you alone right now if your contract didn't have another week to run. But after that, I'll let you strictly alone. You'll never work this club again. You maniac. I began to drink quite heavily, quite noticeably. I was going crazy just from the waiting. And then the waiting came to an end. It was around three in the morning. I was sitting up in bed, in the dark, smoking, when Rory opened her eyes and said, Judd. Yes? The voice. Yes. He is going to kill me here. Right here in this room. Rory. Saturday. This Saturday, at midnight. Oh, John. Oh, Rory, Rory, sweetheart. He's going to shoot me. He has a gun. He's going to shoot me. He, he's going he's to get you downstairs in the manager's office at the club. And while you are there, he's going to come up here. No, 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 Rory, <laughs> Rory, listen to me. I want you to listen to oh, me. John. You're mistaken, do you understand? You've been having another bad dream, and that's all there is to it. No, Judd, I swear it. He just thought of it, just this minute. He's standing at a bar, standing there all by himself, drinking. And he's just this minute decided. You're... you're making it up? Judd, no. It's at the bar over at the Tuscany Hotel. I see it so clear. You're wrong. You're wrong. I'll prove you're wrong. Desk. Uh, Get me the bar at the Tuscany, will you? Over on Sunset? One moment, please. You'll see, Rory. He's not there at all. You'll see, it's just a dream. Just a bad dream. Tuscany Cocktail Lounge. Hello. Is uh, Harry Arnold there at the bar? Harry Arnold? 
No, I'm sorry, he's not. He's not? You sure of that? Sure, I'm sure. He was here all evening, left about a minute ago. I said goodnight to him myself. Want me to have... Look. Look, Lieutenant, my hands. It's just the memory of how I felt at that moment when my hands begin to tremble again. Amazing, isn't it? Now, that was last Thursday night, or rather Friday morning. Towards daybreak, Rory sobbed herself to sleep, but I was restless. I got dressed and went downstairs and, and got into my car. The long drive has always relaxed me. But when I got behind the wheel, oh, I don't know what it was, possibly the fresh air, but... But all at once, I felt as though I couldn't keep my eyes open for another moment. Simply had to have some sleep. So I... I crawled into the back seat, curled myself up in one corner, pulled the rug over me, and went out like a light. I was awakened around noon by the sound of voices. Don't smile at me, you idiot. He may see us. Look businesslike. Where is he? I don't know. Since he hasn't got the car, he must be out walking. Did he fall for it last night? Just like he fell for all the rest of it. The red bathrobe, stooges you planted in the audience. He even phoned the bar just after you left. Oh, I timed it beautifully. Satin skin, satin skin. I can hardly keep away from you. After tomorrow night, we'll have all the time in the world for each other, Harry. You bought the whole story that it's going to happen at midnight? Tomorrow, your place? Every word. Just do what you have to do now. Remember to come to the dressing room before the 8 o'clock show. Tell them you've set up a meeting with Stamper, the manager, in Stamper's office at 12. Yeah, I want them to shake hands and be friends again, I'll tell them. Yes, and don't forget... When you come to our door at midnight, keep talking to the elevator boy. Don't let him go, whatever you do. You want him to testify with self-defense. Uh, don't worry. I won't forget a thing. You'll handle all the rest of it? Just leave it to me. I mean about his gun. That's pretty important, you know. Don't worry. It'll misfire. It'd be difficult for me to tell you what I felt as they walked away, Lieutenant. One part of me felt the way a man ought to feel, I suppose, when he, when he learns that the woman he loves is not only unfaithful, but plotting his death as well. But another part of me felt only relief. Relief at learning there was a gimmick in this too. Ah, they'd been fairly clever for amateurs. Harry had a good excuse for carrying a gun to protect the cash he brought me each Saturday. My own behavior in recent weeks would lend weight to what he would probably offer in his defense, that I must have been crazy, that for no reason at all I'd opened the door, pointed a revolver at him, and threatened his life, that he had to shoot in self-defense. The presence of the elevator boy, well, that could mean only that Harry would shoot just as soon as I opened the door. I'd be found dead with a revolver in my hand and a heartbroken agent at my side. Tableau. I found myself hoping, as I never hoped before, that they'd come to their senses before Saturday. That they'd realize what a vicious, inhuman thing it was they were planning. But just before the eight o'clock show that night, there was a knock at the door of our dressing room. Come in. Oh, uh, Judd, I've been talking to Stamper, the manager. He's sorry there's bad blood between you and wants to square it. I told him you'd be in his office at 12 to talk things over. All right with you? Yeah. We don't want it so we'll never work here again, do we? I mean, there's no reason we should. No reason at all. Button my dress, Judd. Uh, see you later, Judd. Yeah, later. Well, we did the show and then went up to our suite. I convinced Rory that I should meet Harry alone, and then I helped her pack a small overnight bag. I loaded the revolver, and then there was nothing to do but wait. The minutes passed. Nine o'clock, ten, ten thirty, and I waited. Judd. Yes? It doesn't seem right to leave you here alone. Harry might... No, no, you go. Things might not turn out as I planned. I might not be able to stop him. If I fail to stop him... No, no, it's best that you go. Just wait at the motel until you hear from me. Uh, what time is it? Almost eleven. Two minutes of eleven. I... I'm out of cigarettes. Yes? Uh, this is Mr. Stone in 1101. Please send up a carton of players, will you? Right away, Mr. Stone. 
I want you to go now, Rory. Judd, let me call the police, please. Oh, it would be useless. We've gone into it, and it would be useless. Well, then come with me. He won't find anybody here. Then he'd choose another place, another time. Now, here's your valise. You have your gun? In my pocket. You, you won't take any chances. I don't know what I'd do if you were hurt. Or... I won't take any chances. Uh, let me help you on with your coat. Oh, Judd, I love you so. Yeah, I know. And I love you, Rory. I really do, you know. You ready? Yes. Eleven o'clock. You'll be here in an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go now, Rory. Kiss me goodbye. Judd. Oh, the cigarettes. Uh, get them, will you, darling? Will I find change? I shall always remember the look on Harry's face, Lieutenant, as she sank to the floor. They'd concocted a bad dream between them and it had come true. I'll bet he still doesn't know how it happened. If you pass his cell, you might tell him. Just whisper the word gimmick into his ear. Yeah, that's what I said, gimmick. I gimmicked the clock while Rory was dressing. Set it back a full hour. It was eleven to her, but twelve to him. <laughs> I adore gimmicks, don't you? Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Ronald Coleman. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite and bringing back our distinguished star, Mr. Coleman. Thank you, Harlow. You know, it's been over two years since I last played in Autolite's Theater of Thrills, but I've listened to Suspense attain new dramatic heights this season with such exciting fare as Edwin Drood and, of course, Othello. Harlow, my congratulations to our producer-director, Elliot Lewis, and to Waterlight for magnificent radio entertainment. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. And friends, you can always expect the finest from Autolite, the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Every Autolite product is backed by constant research and precision built to the highest standards of quality and performance. No wonder Autolite serves the greatest names in the industry. Yes, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. <laughs> Next week, we recreate one of the great mysteries of the sea. A ship found drifting in perfect condition, but with no human aboard. The mystery of the Marie Celeste. Our star, Mr. Van Heflin. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Bluskin. A Vision of Death was adapted for Suspense by Walter Brown Newman from the original story by Jerry Hausner. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Aurora. Featured in the cast were High Aberback, Benny Rubin, Julie Bennett, and Charles Calvert. You can buy Autolite Stayful batteries, Autolite resistor or standard type spark plugs, and Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network.